good evening, everybody. Um, uh, this is very interesting. I, I think we're going to see lots of cross connections in these uh, presentations this evening because some of the things that Rich is touching on, like um, contact period between um, American Indians and, and Europeans and good museum collections. I'm on the board of the Hopewell Museum and we have a very nice collection there, not as, not as dramatic as the Hunterdon County one, I think, but uh, uh, we're, we're hoping to start cataloging that um, very soon. Um, and I think there's a hint in uh, some of the questions that came up of connections possibly between American Indians in this area and those further to the west, possibly in the Ohio Valley. These are very, very tenuous um, things, but, um, but they're certainly worth, um, worth talking about. So let me move right into the, uh, the topic here. So, so I'm really going to be talking about um, Sowland Mountain, which um, I expect many of you are uh, familiar with, and, and uh, it's a dominant feature of, of northern Mercer County and southern and Hunterdon County. Um, this boundary of it was created um, uh, as part of a planning study about 25 years ago now, I suppose, uh, but it sort of defines the topographical area and, and sort of what it is, about 19 miles long, southwest to northeast, highest point, 567 feet above sea level. Wow. Um, and it's, it's a distinctive region with its own ecology, its own um, conservancy organization, the Salon Conservancy, which advocates for conserving its many unique um, characteristics. And over the last few years, I and a number of other people, as you've heard, uh, have had the privilege of starting to study the landscape history of this piece of landscape. Uh, the cultural landscape history and and uh, although it's a very early days yet it's there's we've come up with a number of interesting uh, uh, things about it and I'm going to be talking primarily about um, what we know about American Indian activity uh, on and around Sal and Mountain and and uh, also something about African Americans on Sal and Mountain which is another topic that's uh, very current at the moment and and again something with which I'm uh, very glad to be um, involved. So let's start first of all with the, um, obviously with the American Indian presence. And a lot of this uh, goes back to looking at the geology. What, what, what is Sal and Mountain and why does it stick up like that? And, and, and why, is it, uh, why is it different? Well, you see on this geological map, this, this, gr this great swath of red over here, and these outlying blobs of red down at the southern um, side of the mountain. Now these are, as it says over here, diabase. These are igneous rocks, not a volcano exactly, stuff that was developed deep underground and has later come to the surface and, and weathered, weathered out. And this produces the characteristic um, dramatic stony uh, outcroppings of Sal and Mountain that many people I'm sure are, are familiar with. The other um, characteristic of the Sal and Mountains geology is the green here, here called the Lokatong Foundation. And this is a type of stone called argillite. Uh, and you see it up here. This is a, a, a sign on Route 31 um, up, um, where is it? It's sort of, sort of up here somewhere, south of Flemington, um, uh, south of the Pine Ridge, uh, no, the Pine, the Pine Ridge Golf Course. <laughs> um, uh, and this sign notes that argillite was a very extensively used raw material for stone tools of all kinds uh, by American Indians, and particularly in the period that we call the Middle Woodland, which is like the about from 2000 to about 1000 years ago, but it's used at other times too. And um, many of the artifacts that are found in this area uh, are argillite made either from the argillite here or from north of Flemington, where there are other important um, uh, outcrops. So we have here a rather, um, you know, a dramatic landscape feature, these uh, rocky outcrops in the red bits, and this really very easily accessible raw material argillite, which you can see in the sides of all the streams coming down off the south side of Salon Mountain, 
uh, some of which flooded Hopewell and other areas a few weeks ago. Um, and so it's very easy to obtain. You don't have to go out and dig deep trenches or anything to find it. You can walk along a river bank or a stream or a creek and, and, and pull nice pieces out uh, for use um, um, as, as artifacts. And so indeed, that's what we find. And um, the, uh, luckily, over the last couple of years, we've, we've got, had a couple of finds from the um, uh, uh, south side of Salem Mountain, which are actually well provenienced, by which we mean we know exactly where they came from. This is the problem of many of the collections that we have in museums, certainly uh, in the Hopewell Museum, and I suspect also in the Huntington County Historical Society collection, is that they're not often very rec well recorded exactly where they came from. Um, but these two, we know exactly uh, where they came from. Um, th this one is from um, uh, the, the little village of Woodsville. It was found by Benita Grant, who uh, is currently the archivist for the Hopewell Museum and, and also worked in the special collections at Rutgers for many years. Um, and then this one here is from the wonderful goat, another farm of, of Brew and Charlie's Katzenbach on Route 518, um, just north of Hopewell, Hopewell Borough. And this, this was found right next to a, um, a springhead. So what are these things? There you, there are, these are a very common artifact. There we've got about 40 of them in the Hopewell collection alone. Um, and um, they are, um, what's called um, ground stone artifacts. In other words, they're not chipped uh, like you think of a, a typical arrowhead or spear point as being sort of flaked and chipped. These have been made by finding a nice uh, correct size stone and then rubbing it and pecking. What we mean by pecking it is hitting it with another stone. You can see these little pecking holes here on the groove of this ax particularly and also on this one. And so rubbing it on sandstone or other coarse materials for a long time uh, uh, until you get it to the shape that you want it to be. And the grooves, of course, are to hold uh, probably vegetable uh, matter or, or um, rawhide thongs to hold the axe head onto a wooden handle. And we know, uh, we know this because examples have actually been found preserved that, that show how this was done. Um, and as you can see from the um, note at the bottom, they, they were used over a very long period of time, from about 8,000 to at least 3,000 years ago. Uh, and so they were obviously a pretty good, useful tool. But what were they for? Well, probably they really are mostly axes. They're for chopping up wood, chopping down trees, and making wood into things. And, and so what they represent is a considerable advance in um, uh, people's ability to control and manage and manipulate the environment that they're in. Because before these things came along, uh, there were no tools of this kind, as far as we know, um, that, that American Indians would have been using. So what we're seeing in this archaic period is a much greater use being made of the forest resources, I think. Um, and that's important because what we're learning uh, more and more uh, now um, is that American Indians were very active agents in their environment. In other words, um, the traditional picture of, of Indians living in a fairly, you know, state of nature, you know, uh, touching lightly on the land and all those things um, uh, is partly true, of course, but, but um, there's a lot more going on and a lot more conscious effort to make the landscape more useful to people uh, than I think we've previously realized. And this is, this is being realized all over the Americas now. And, and uh, it, it shows a, a very interesting change in how we view uh, how American, Native uh, American Indians, I used to call them, uh, uh, have used this, uh, the land. Uh, over the years, quite different from the traditional picture, I think, than, we, than we've been given. So that's one aspect of what we're learning about, um, about uh, American Indians on Sale and Mountain. They're using it, uh, they're doing things there, they're chopping up wood and, 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 uh, and, and things like this, and obviously finding other food resources too, one would imagine. 
But what about these areas higher up, the diabase areas with their strange stone outcroppings? Well, um, it was hard to imagine what could really have been done up here um, in these areas other than perhaps a bit of hunting because you can't really, the, the, the vegetation is not, there's probably not many food edible vegetation up there. Um, obviously there are animals that you can hunt. Um, but over the last couple of years, me and a, a, a few other people have come to sort of think, well, maybe, maybe there was something more special about this landscape uh, than just those sort of utilitarian um, uses. Maybe these uh, unusual rock formations, which you can see from these fine ladies of about 1900, have attracted attention but always uh, people like to look at funny things like this. Um, and um, uh, perhaps this perception of this landscape as something out of the ordinary uh, goes back many hundreds of years. I, I suspect it may well do. Um, and um, you know, there's nothing much like this uh, around here. This is an unusual place that, that I think um, American Indians would have known about and, and come to, but what would they have done when they got here? I'm now treading into sort of some fairly, um, what should we say, cutting edge or controversial um, areas of, 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 of current research. There's a big debate going on at the moment about features that are found in the woodlands of New England and of the Mid-Atlantic area. If you've walked around on Salem Mountain or any other upland area in New Jersey, you'll have noticed lots of stone walls wandering through the landscape, wandering through the woodlands. And if you go to New England, you'll see even more of them. They're all over the place. Now, the conventional view of these walls, particularly, is that they are the product of European um, settlers in the 18th and 19th centuries, uh, clearing the land and use, you know, using the stones, piling them up into walls or other piles of stones. Uh, to get to clear the land for uh, probably mostly grazing. And I think there's little doubt that most of these are indeed that, but there are some things out there that don't quite fit um, with that interpretation. This is a quite a well-known site for, for those who are interested in this kind of thing called uh, Ole Hills in Berks County, Pennsylvania, not far across the River Delaware. Um, and in at this place, there are these rather unusual and quite well constructed sort of cairns and mounds uh, in the landscape, as well as, uh, as well as some walls. And some researchers think that these are uh, American Indian structures, not uh, European farming structures. Uh, there's no time to go into this into a huge amount of detail, but, but uh, as I've looked into this more, I've come to think that there is really no reason why there should not be um, uh, physical evidences of American Indians of this kind um, in, in, in Eastern North America. And, and, uh, and, um, and we can, um, there's a lot of debate about this, but, uh, but I'm, I'm really coming down to think this is, must be the case. So, um, and this is partly why I'm uh, particularly interested in this at this time. A, a couple of years ago, I was fortunate enough to have a small grant um, from the Salem Conservancy um, to do uh, a landscape study of uh, an area near Lambertville, um, which is where the reservoir is, if some of you know that area. Um, and there's a beautiful trail that goes through that area called the Rock Hopper Trail, because there are quite a lot of rocks to hop across. Um, and one day when I was walking along the trail, I looked to my right and I saw this, particularly this setting of stones here. The, the trail actually just goes right across, the, across this thing right here. And then as I looked around, I saw more and more stones in a line. And then um, a few months later, I, I took a volunteer with me with a leaf blower <laughs> and we um, um, blew the leaves off uh, this area and the area around it, um, just to make sure that we weren't, you know, making things up. And by the time we had done this, it was quite clear to me that this was a deliberate stone setting, about 100 yards long, uh, goes past this guy and over to the air where, where the other 
uh, range pole is. This is the view from the other end. It seems to end at this big rock here. Here it goes winding through. It's been grown over by this big tree, uh, goes winding over and back to the, this end. And for a while, I was sort of trying to make sure I wasn't, you know, making things up or anything or inventing anything. But um, the more people who have seen it uh, and the more I've seen it um, and the more comparison uh, that we've done, I think there is a very strong possibility that this is indeed um, an American Indian um, stone setting, which is very exciting indeed, um, if it's, if it's, if it's the case. And I think there's, there's growing reason to think that it is. Um, uh, I did this uh, little quick uh, map of it here, just showing only, only drew the biggest stones because it would have taken a long time to do it. Um, but here's the, what we might call the head end, if you like. Uh, and uh, you see how winding it is, and serpentiform, and ending up at this big rock. And although I don't want to push this analogy too far, the most famous serpent effigy in prehistoric North America is the Serpent Mound in Adams County, Ohio, which is a um, National Park Service site. This thing is about a quarter of a mile long, and it's an earthen bank, but you can see how it wiggles around, comes to an end in a swirl here, and has some sort of head or something at one end. There's been various interpretations of this. Is it a snake holding an egg or something? We don't know really, but it's clearly a major ritual structure. And of course, I've cleverly placed this image so it, you can see how similar it is to my little hundred foot long um, setting uh, on, uh, on the western end of Salmon Mountain. Um, so um, this, is, this is very, uh, to me, extremely uh, exciting. And I, 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 as I said, it take me a while to really um, uh, be comfortable, if you like, with this, with this idea. But um, uh, of course, other people are looking around on Sal and Mountain. One of these is Martin Rapp, my, my good friend Martin Rapp. And he has been wandering around the area uh, around that, um, what we call it an effigy or stone setting. And he's found many examples of these little piles of rocks, which when you're walking in the woods, you say, oh yeah, look, that's a pile of rocks. Um, but these are deliberately placed um, entities. They are not the result of modern quarrying because the stone is not quarried at all. And at Rockhopper, you can certainly prove this because there is extensive 19th century quarrying uh, up there, not far from here, and it doesn't look anything like this at all. So there are other things out there. And I think as time goes on, uh, more and more of these things will be, I hope, um, identified uh, and we'll get a better sense of this kind of use of the landscape. Now, what, what does this mean? Well, clearly we're entering into the, into the area of beliefs, spirituality. These are not practical things in a, in a sense that they're, you know, they're helping you prepare food or anything. They seem to have a, a, a different and a more, what should we say, a, um, spiritual dimension to them. And my emerging idea, I can't prove this yet, of course, but, but I think that maybe these diabase areas with their unusual rock formations were places where people went on what we might call or think of as vision quests and other um, um, rituals to, to identify who you are, who your totem animal might be. Uh, this is using analogies, obviously, from more recent American Indian that we know more about. Um, so I think what I'm suggesting is that the diabase landscape of Sal and Mountain may be regarded as a Native American, uh, sorry, American Indian, quote, ritual landscape. This is a very beginning of this idea, and I'm, I think it's the first time I've even actually said that that way. Um, but, but anyway, if it's true and, and uh, as, as work goes on, I think uh, um, this is going to be proved to be extremely interesting. So that's two, two aspects of American Indian uh, life on um, uh, Sal and Mount. I just want to end up by emphasizing really how little we know at the moment. Um, here, here, is, here is the outline of Sal and Mount, superimposed by the known archaeological sites as known by the New Jersey State Museum uh, on Sal and Mount. Well, you see there's nothing up at this higher northern end, and most of the 
fine spots of artifacts are dotted around the edges. And of course, there's a lot more once you get off the mountain, there's a lot more sites down in uh, Southern Hopewell Township here, for example, and Ewing. Um, but that doesn't, that really, all these maps show you is where people have looked and where people have found things. Uh, it, it doesn't really necessarily tell you much else. What I've also added onto this map are the two um, sites of contact period villages, which we know about uh, from land records, European land records of the late 1600s uh, on either side of what's now Hopewell Borough, uh, Rusa Monson over here and Mina Panasson over there. We know roughly where they, well, fairly closely where they are. And we know that both of these villages were definitely occupied at the time of early um, European English, mostly settlement in this area in the late 1600s. Indeed, both of these villages uh, were chosen by prominent early European settlers as the sites of their plantations, I think because the areas were already cleared uh, for fields, uh, Indians were already still there, and the, the, the man who settled here, Roger Park, uh, clearly uh, learned a lot of uh, uh, herbal law, medicine law, from uh, the Indians with whom he was a, a neighbor for what should we say, a decade or two, perhaps. So we're beginning to understand something more about the interaction of American Indians and uh, initially at least Europeans in this area, which now brings us on to uh, another group of people that there's a great deal of new interest in the history of, at least among those of us who aren't African-American, um, you know, the African-Americans uh, of, of uh, of uh, the United States generally. Um, uh, I'm fortunate to be uh, on the board of the Mount Zion AME Church or the Stoutsburg Sal and African American Museum, which is promoting research on Sal and Mountain. Uh, and uh, one of their products has been this magnificent map uh, produced by uh, Kevin Berkman um, of, of showing some of, the, some of the important sites for African American history um, on Sal and um, Mountain. And uh, I haven't got time to go through many of these, but I just want to look at a couple of them. Uh, this is the Mount Zion AME Church, the original site up here on the top of the mountain. And then uh, now the, the later site, which was here in 1899, um, down here on Hollow Road, just sort of below the really steep side um, of the mountain. But as you can see, there are many other interesting uh, sites of, uh, around. Something a bit about why African Americans were here. Uh, this is a very complex story and one I'm not really qualified to uh, go into in, in too much detail. Um, you should read If These Stones Could Talk uh, by Elaine Buck and Beverly Mills. One of the main reasons African Americans were living on, our, on Salem Mountain was they were work, working in the peach orchards in the 19th century. Here are two on the 1849, on an 1849 map, actually um, marked as peach orchard. But they'd been here before the peach boom uh, happened anyway, but it's one, one aspect of, of that. And finally, just jumping down to two, two um, uh, sites, both of them religious sites. So in a way, tying us up perhaps with the, um, the uh, ritual landscape of the, um, American Indians. Um, uh, this is the uh, uh, 1850 map of um, Somerset County that shows, here we go, African church. Here we go, uh, next to a house owned by um, the Wyckoffs and just opposite a blacksmith's shop. Um, and here it is in 1860. Uh, I think this actually is intended to say AC for African church. Uh, here is the, the Wyckoff store by this time, blacksmith shop not shown here. Um, but um, this is this, this, so this church is here by 1850. We don't know when it was actually um, established. Um, but we were able to pin down exactly where it is by uh, the modern tax map, although one of the earlier versions of the modern tax map, which very helpfully calls this piece of ground, the church lot. Um, and so we were able to go up and look at this. And this is the site of the 
African church on the top of Saoland Mountain. It's now part of the Wyckoff uh, store property. The, the people living here were very gracious in allowing us to go out here. The church was in here somewhere. I should stress this is private property. It belongs to them. It's not an open historic site or anything like that. And uh, no, no archaeological work or anything has been done here. But this is where that first church was. Um, so this is this kind of detective, fun detective landscape work um, that's going on uh, as far as African-American history is concerned. And then finally, we were able to, with the Archaeological Society of New Jersey, ta -da, um, we, uh, uh, the museum and the society, um, did a small archaeological excavation at the site of the 1890, this is the 1899 um, uh, church building. Uh, this is under restoration as a museum and a um, uh, um, uh, you know, handicap ramp is going to be built out the back here. So in good archaeological fashion, we did some shovel tests in the area where this ramp is going to be built uh, to see what we could uh, recover about the material, the material life of the people who worshipped in this church until the 1980s, actually. Um, this was a very, uh, very well attended event. It was um, um, uh, quite cold and right in the middle of COVID, but we recovered about 300 artifacts relating to activities at this church. And, um, you know, we can hope to do more over the years as time goes by. This is a great public outreach um, involving the community in the history of people who have very largely in our conventional histories been invisible. Um, so um, just uh, one final note there, there is very high quality research being done in other places on Salon Mountain. And this one is um, <clears throat> the Honey Hollow area, which is in the southwest of, of Salon Mountain. This is Baldpate Mountain here and a little off layer called Mount Canoe. This is a, a very uh, professional landscape history study done by Hunter Research a couple of years ago, uh, concerned, trying to track down uh, Native American, uh, excuse me, African American communities here. Very difficult work to do. There's great challenges in finding out where these people are living because they don't appear in the documents. But they were able to identify 12 free African American families living in this general area between 1830 and 1940. And that wasn't really fully understood before or where these, where these people specifically were living, but it was building on an oral tradition from the African-American community that had this had been a focus of African-American life. So I hope those uh, that rapid run through has given you a sense of ongoing research on Sal and Man, very exciting and, and new discoveries being made. Some of the things I've said will prove, probably prove to be wrong, but that's fine. That's how science works. So thank you very much.